Well, here I am, Ballet Home Beach in Bangor. Actually, the third day in Cam, and I'm about to get soaked. And it's the third day of the film festival, and I've seen my film up on the big screen. Lots of movie stars, Barry Norman. I suppose this is really what it's all about. But you never think about that when you're writing the book. You know, seven years ago, eight years ago, all you want to do is write a book. You could never have thought that this would have happened. I mean, this is, your dreams keep changing. Maybe next year we'll go to Hollywood, County Down or Los Angeles, you never quite know. Suppose you should have done that. is about money and about people selling. <laughs> if you grew up in London or in a sort of media place where there's lots of things about movies and, and people work in the industry and they work in TV, coming from Bangor uh, you know, and Northern Ireland where there's no real history of, of a film industry, for me to be you know, here in Cannes, with a huge poster of divorcing Jack dominating the main street. That's just a dream come true for me. I shouldn't have to worry about whether it's going to get distributed in Azerbaijan or somewhere. It, you know, it doesn't faze me. I know it's getting distributed throughout the United Kingdom and Ireland. I'll be more than happy to see it in my local Cineplex. I didn't know you were coming. Yeah. This is the first can screening. It's 11 o'clock on Friday morning. Um, so, great nervousness. Uh, we're hoping for a good crowd here and a good response. So, we're, uh, we're uh, nervous, as you can see. Lord Dunleith in County Down is one location for the story of Starkey, a troubled and troublesome reporter. The film is being made by Scala, which also made The Crying Game. A tight budget means a relatively short preparation time and a hectic eight-week schedule. I came across the book um, in Edinburgh three years ago, and a friend of mine said that uh, she was working with a new writer from Northern Ireland um, called Colin Bateman and um, threatened to send me the manuscript, which she eventually did. I'm always uh, slightly cautious of book manuscripts because uh, um, most scripts that you get as a, as a drama producer are, are quite slim, but of course manuscripts are really sort of big, so I, I carried it around for about three weeks before I started to read it. And then the moment I picked up the first page, uh, I just carried on to the end. We discovered that the BBC and Robert Cooper um, owned the rights and we approached them to see whether it would be possible for Scala to become in involved. And Robert was very enthusiastic about the idea and we started to jointly develop it. It was so obvious that this was a feature film and that the, the novelist, Colin Bateman, would be such a natural screenwriter. Originally there was another writer involved in it. But at the time, I was more than happy just to have it adapted. It was only, I think, when I actually read the script and it, uh, I realised I'd been scared of, of writing a script as well, I think. I didn't have that confidence. Um, but once I'd read it and saw what had happened to my material, I knew I could equal that or hopefully do better. And it wasn't bad writing, it was just the fact that it was an English writer and, and what he had written added to it sounded English. And I knew, you know, obviously if I was writing it, it would, it would, it would mesh with the original words. When I was eight years old, I woke up in the middle of the night and found my brother pissing on my typewriter. I decided there and then that there was something wonderful about alcohol. And as my artistic interest grew, I discovered that many of my heroes had had impassioned affairs with what my old daughter referred to as the devil's vomit. Brendan Beyond, Dylan Thomas, George Bass, yeah, We met financiers last year, and Robert goes, we've got a really good Irish director, he's gonna do a great job. And they go, really? So you got Neil or Jim? I said, well, well, he's... So what's this kid done? I said, 
while he's done two short films. Uh, oh, really? And you're expecting me to put $3 million into a movie with a kid who's done two short films? Get out of here. Can I yeah. stick to a man on yeah. either side? Yeah. Well, basically, it's just after what's happening to Margaret. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'd done a short film called The Connivers about these two kids who get up to mischief on their summer holidays. And uh, I went for an interview for the bill uh, on the same day that I went to meet Robert Cooper for this job. And the lady at the bill, she said, I guess I really liked your short film, but I do think just a little bit more experience. Maybe if you come back having done something else, I think we might have, we might be able to slot you in. I went, okay, thanks. And then I went and had the interview with Robert, and a week later I landed the divorcing Jack job. Okay, thank you. Um, okay, can we bring the answers in now, please? First AD has to initially schedule the film, which means decide what scene you do each day. There'll, there'll normally be a rough schedule when you arrive that has to be done for the financiers. Every day I have to predict the future and work out when we will want something at what particular time. So you have to kind of live the whole film first of all. And then when you're actually shooting, I'm the one who says what happened so that everybody knows what we're doing each day. Action. Cut. Cut, That was good, you. Dave. That was good. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. I've been handed uh, a stack of rewrites. I just want to confirm who I should be giving them out to. If you, if you could just um, give no. them to wardrobe and makeup. You're going to come into the hallway. You can bring four copies over to me on set. We are doing another shot. So I have to call the actors. I have to choreograph the background action. I'm the director's voice, as it were. So the director and the cameraman tell me things, and then I have to make sure that everything is told to them. You know, you, you have to do everything. Yeah, Mary, where everyone knows that you have to kind of... Well, it's about a quarter to ten on the fourth day of filming today. We're here at uh, Ballywater Park, the home of the Dunleaths, who've kindly lent it to us to shoot the sequences about Michael Brin, who's the uh, political campaigner in the film. The director, David Caffrey, wanted to give Brin a very American feeling to him, so as you can see, the campaign posters reflect that sort of quality. Be turned red like that, always these wheels is going to hell. Okay, that's good. We're not on any location for longer than two or three days on this shoot because it's what's known as a sort of a road movie. It's a sort of an odyssey around Belfast and around Northern Ireland. shot around Franklin Street and round past the Europa Hotel in Belfast. Here we have, um, we're now about 11, 11.30 and we have two shots here of our main characters, David Thulis and Brona Gallagher, who plays a rather irate um, taxi driver. And we have this piece of equipment here, which means that we can put a camera position. Uh, go ahead, excuse me. Okay, Brona and uh, Brona's in the car, David is standing David Cameron at the book car. OK, as soon as he's in the car, I'll be right over. Uh, and then what will happen is it gives us control over doing a scene, because obviously when a car's moving, you can't sit on the bonnet and film it. So if you can see in the back, you see how the camera is rigged there. But um, we're going to do a rehearsal now, and then we'll set off on a route to just go round and round and round, and then we'll move the camera to do the other character. We have a problem this morning because it's raining. <laughs> and we're going to have rain on the windscreen and this scene is meant to be in dry, so I can see it's going to be a lot of mopping and going. The one 
one thing about a low loader which is particularly important is it rides very low to the ground so that you look as if the car is actually travelling on the ground. Sparky! Hey. That's some fucking crap you write in a fucking paper. Thanks. Mind you, the husband loves it. Good. But then he's a stupid fucker. I see. But not stupid enough to drive a fucking taxi, that's for sure. No. The character I'm playing is a taxi driver who's very insulting to Starkey when he does not need it. And he jumps into uh, the cab a couple of times and she's there like a gremlin. Or as the script describes, like a cranky, which I'm not very happy about at all, no offence. Fuck away off and die! But she's not a nice lady at all. I mean, it's a tiny part that I'm playing, but I mean, The Commitments was the last feature film I've worked on in Ireland. And if you're out of Ireland for a while, people forget your face, you know? Can is like a strange combination of hype, lots of people sort of saying, I've got this, I've got that, and never being quite sure, and deadly seriousness of the completed films. So it works on two very, very different levels. There's no more bullshit when the film is there. On the screen, you know, what you say about it doesn't actually make any difference. That was a very serious screening. So distributors, exhibitors, and some press, uh, and general sort of trade people as well, because uh, an awful lot depends in can on word of mouth. But for, for a serious uh, daytime screening, it seemed to go okay. Everyone's going to come up to you and say, great movie, well done, but, you know, the word on the street will be, it'll come of its own accord. So. I think 11 o'clock on a Friday morning in Cannes with a trade audience is just about one of the toughest we're going to have. Um, and it seemed to go all right. It's very difficult to tell. I think, you know, we'll know as the word gets around whether it's good or bad, and we'll know certainly by Sunday, by the Sunday screening. By that point, we'll know how well that screening went. It's particularly important for the Northern Ireland film industry that this film makes money, that it isn't one of those films that doesn't get a good release, doesn't do commercially. But it's important for a film industry in a place like Northern Ireland that it becomes known as a place that, where you can make commercially viable films. Yes, I'll answer one Mr. question Mr. at a time. Mr. Mr. Bryn? You were recently voted the sexiest man in Ireland by Northern Woman magazine. How does your wife feel about that? Oh, gosh. <laughs> You'll have to ask my wife that. I mean, I, I if I explain too much about the character of Bryn, I give a lot away of the, of, the, of the piece. And if people haven't read the book and they're looking forward to the film, then all I can say is, would you trust this man? And my job is to make people, you know, think they can trust him. How many people do you need for scene 26? 20 arrives. Yeah. About 10 or 15. 10. So if we can have 10 people, say five from that door, five from that door. If you can't stay, then obviously you must go. But uh, if you can, I'd just like to use you for the next shot, which comes before the whole scene. I'd well, today now it's quarter to six, and we've been here since 7.30. Last day we were in at two, mm -hmm. and we finished at 8.30 in the evening. So, and you're standing around and hanging around most of that time. So, yeah. we'll, I mean, we've had a really good laugh. Yes, we do, don't we? We do, yes. yes. So, it's a little bit of applause for the vocal piece, and then someone goes, oh, but Mr. Brin, you know, and that will stop the applause, and it will also keep him in this position, all right? Otherwise, everything's the same. Busy day. <laughs> um, simply because we've had, like, you know, row, uh, a lot of people here, and, well, it's only about 105 extras, but, um, you're trying to make them look like there's 3,000, and of course there aren't, so you're having to cheat around and fill up corners. Um, it's always a problem in films, it's making it look more busy than it is, and you never have enough extras because they're so expensive. Um, but it's been good, and they've all been great fun, and they've all got into the spirit of it, which really helps us, because they've been very natural and very real, which for me is always you know, rewarding when they come across well. I suppose that was just your own little line, but the line uh, when this is, uh, are you keeping good contact with the Americans? I say it anyway, I mightn't use it, but say it anyway. Yeah, we'll take the money. Yeah. What was the He says with their money, absolutely. Oh, that's it, thank you. Okay, thanks. Well, I wrote that. <laughs> <laughs> and do you, you intend to maintain good relations with the US? With their money, absolutely. Yeah. What sort of majority are you looking for? Only the Irish people can tell me that. Probably. Thank you.
That's beat a lot of you. <laughs> 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 That's good. James. I've seen so many films about the Troubles in Northern Ireland, and there are, there's going to be many more films about the Troubles in Northern Ireland. And I think sometimes that might just... Uh, people go, oh, God, here we go again, sort of thing. But this is brilliant, because it is about, essentially, a man trying to keep his marriage together. And as we all know in, 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 in this um, life, it's, that's a difficult enough job as it is. But the, the troubles are the background. So set amidst all the troubles, it's like this madness and mayhem, which I think is the genius of the script. Thankfully, Connie's done the script as well. When I was writing the book, I had no thoughts on cast or anything like that. Once they started casting the film, you know, they did come to me and, and say, what do you think of this guy, what do you think of that? And I had really no idea, because I'd never really worked with actors before. And it's very difficult to imagine how they're going to do something on screen. I sat in on some of the auditions and I thought, God, all these people are dreadful. You know, this is really embarrassing. And then I saw them on the screen later on and thought, oh, right, this director does know something, because they, they shine on screen. Plain old bush. David will come and talk to me, he'll come and talk to everybody about, you know, what will we do in the film. You know, he, he likes to get advice, likes to get input. Bollocks. I'm not saying he necessarily took the advice, but, you know, he, he, he'll get five or six different viewpoints and go with what he feels is right. And after all, I mean, it's, that's the director's job, to direct. Yeah, let's just... You know, let's let's just, just carry on doing it. Yeah, let's <laughs> carry on doing it. Cause We're here at the Crown Bar today, uh, chosen, A, because it's the best-looking bar in Belfast, and B, because it has a very special place in film history, which was that it starred in the James Mason film, okay, Odd Man right Out. Um, however, Odd Man Out obviously had more money than we did because they were able to rebuild the entire bar at Pinewood Studios. Perfectly, I might add, there's a still of it in there. But it looks very good in real life. Too. We have to make what's known as a showreel to go to a very important film market where our sales company, Winchester, will try to uh, pre-sell the film to distributors from around the world. The market is very important because the film needs to make money. Uh, we've raised three million pounds from people to make this film. It's a commercial film, and it needs to make that money back. We're here really to celebrate the fact that there are five films here which the Northern Ireland Film Council was responsible for helping to be made partly or entirely in Northern Ireland. It certainly has its own character. It certainly has its own light. It certainly has its own charm. Please keep Northern Ireland in mind if you are planning a film. I've always been very annoyed by films that go and, and shoot in Manchester or Dublin or somewhere and pretend to be Northern Ireland. I've, I mean, there's, there's been no history of, of attacks on artists or filmmakers or writers or anything like that in the whole 30 years of the, the Troubles. Uh, I just couldn't see the reason why they were shooting in other places. Right, these dummies are uh, they're going to be used for the blow-up scene, the cars, which is going to film tomorrow. They've been shipped over from England. I think they're just going to get badly burned. They're made out of rubber. But uh, they're going to save the head of the real actors anyway. <laughs> See what I mean about peace? A bit more separation. I mean, I'm almost See, what I just push Robert what I'd like. between Robert and David yeah. and then throw the punch. And then give him a beat to be there, mm -hmm. and then come in. We were using an American completion guarantor who were prone to look at CNN headlines and call us to see were we anywhere near the recent marches or, or whatever. And once the ceasefire was announced, they sort of calmed down on that. I mean, a lot of it has to do with the sort of um, portrayal of Northern Ireland in films as recent as The Devil's Own. And these are the, this is the sort of impression that Northern Ireland um, has been given to an American and worldwide audience. And the great thing about Divorcing Jack is it transcends all notions like that. It does um, poke fun at everyone, no matter what their religion or, or their political background. Fuck you, Prime Minister! 
See what I mean about peace? Hey! Well, we've been here since yesterday morning, um, and uh, it's uh, been quite difficult with the weather. The weather's been quite capricious, four seasons weather, all in one day. So, although it's a three million pound budget, which sounds like a lot of money, it's spread very, very thin throughout the whole film. Most of the weeks are six day weeks. We have 45 shooting days. Those shooting days are 12 hours long. Although it's a 12 hour day, really it comes to about for 14, in some cases, 15 hours a day. This type of weapon here uh, needs the Secretary of State's permission even to, to have it in Northern Ireland. Uh, so there's quite a lot involved in even having it here on the set. Most actors are not used to handling firearms, so they have to be given instruction and even how to hold the weapons. Within about 15 feet of the muzzle of the gun, there's quite a flash comes out of them, especially for camera effect. So the idea is not to point them directly at anyone's face when firing them. So the actors must realize that they are still dangerous, even though they are back from the blanks. So we're about to do a big explosion up there. <laughs> the car with the dummies in it is the rigged car, and then the other car will drive that way, so you, you do this, and then that one gets to that point, then it blows. So once this car's got to here, that's when the explosion will happen. We've got two cameras running on this. Both will be protected by hides, because inside this vehicle is exploding petrol. Uh, bags filled with petrol will explode, the windows will shatter, doors will come off, it's all... Basically, it's all rigged to explode in a particular way, but there are obviously safety precautions we have to follow because if it does go wrong, flying glass, etc., could cut someone's eye out or something. And roll cameras. Camera B rolling. Those cameras are rolling. Active. There's an air of violence about the place, even though it isn't, you know, you don't see any violence. I haven't seen any violence, touch wood. Um, but, you know, just to walk around a city where machine guns are painted on the walls and all the references are to a violent struggle. Um, and uh, some of the public buildings, the way they're barricaded and armoured and fortified, uh, I find that a little disturbing. It looks like a city at war sometimes. Don't have the fucking tape. Okay, Starkey. I'm gonna make this very simple for you. I'm gonna count to three. Now, if you haven't told me where the tape is by the time I get to three, Nosy Parker here learns to fly. Okay, so it's just the same what they do. Okay. Normally, uh, when you come to a set, it's built in what's known as a sound stage. And a sound stage is called a sound stage because it's completely soundproofed. Um, it has perfect acoustics and it's not echoey. Uh, so here we are in the Michelin factory at Molusk, and we're hoping it's not going to rain too hard because it's got a tin roof. And it sounds like somebody playing ping pong up there when it does. But um, we're coping very well because people here are being very helpful. And we've got a big bell which goes off every time we do a take. And for all the units around here suddenly put down their tools and let us go ahead and uh, shoot the scene. And then we resound the bell twice again after that. And then suddenly all the hammering starts again round about. So people have been great. This is the 
scene where um, Parker's being strung up at, at about 15 stories up in a big um, apartment, and you can see with the uh, skyline here, he's way up high, and um, he's been used to threaten Starkey so that Starkey gives them news about the tape. Put your feet round the wires. That's it. Whoa, whoa. Right, down a smidge. No news, no news. That's it there, lovely. I play a guy called uh, Pat Keegan, known as Cow Pat Keegan to everybody else, obviously. Jason, we're going to need you. Go, go, I'm so sorry. I'm the same He'll be back. Is that number ones or number twos? Dave, props. OK. We need the machete, please. OK, that's good. Yep. I read lots and lots of very crap scripts, everyone in the business does, and um, I've just done a big special effects film for six months in the studio somewhere where you know the, the director and the special effects were the star and it was great it was fantastically good fun but to suddenly read a, a small character piece just dripping with wit it's very refreshing action Starkey tell him where the fucking tape is Starkey please what the fuck are you talking about there's no point tell him where the fucking tape is are you kidding me? Okay. Tell him okay. what okay. I'm saying! Fucking James Stockton! Fucking Stockton! See these young yeah, actors, they give it all before you do a take, and then they've got nothing left. Fuck it! Because divorcing Jack has this sort of wonderful spaghetti western style shootout in the middle of it, which has to take place in the middle of Belfast at night, um, clearly that sort of comes with a certain number of, sort of worries uh, attached to it. So um, we're wondering how best to, to do this sort of pretty major battle. We're going to have some fairly big weapons there, automatic weapons, and the noise of those carries quite a long way. So um, we're, uh, we're trying to work out the best ways of doing that. This is quite exceptional to be allowed to do this because we're in Belfast and we've been given permission to have Kalashnikov farm. So that's something that everyone's going to be watching very carefully. Because um, yeah. it's quite, you know, people recognise the sound of the Latin fire, so we've had to make very special provisions to do it. and it looks like a bullet's hit the hole. There's 120 hits in it, so it's supposed to be uh, quite spectacular, hopefully. At the end of the day, I didn't feel under pressure to lose anything that I was really near and dear about. Can I get the reverse down his shoulder? Yes, you can. I was near and dear about the Magnificent Seven section because the way I did it, I set it up for this piece of music, and even Nick, the editor, was like, Jesus, what's he at? There's no way this... But when we put the music, when we got the kind of uh, the score, and we put it to the Buzzy Berkeley sequence, where they all come out in formation and around a corner, and they're in the seven, and uh, just let rip down this alleyway. So I dug my heels in and I nearly, they nearly prized it away from me because it cost so much money. But it's still in the movie. Action! It's four o'clock in the morning. I think we're probably about an hour and a half behind on the material we have. We have to get overall about 38 shots over two nights with a lot of action in them. OK, rehearsing and... Window up when we go for it. Right. Have we just been waiting for 10 minutes for not to do a window up? Action! Good evening, God help me! Thank you, sister. You can stick your sister up your hole. Ah! Ah! 
And you're bleeding all over my friggin' car. Oh, oh, oh. Do you mind me asking which particular order you're from? You stag me as my Armalite and Carmelite. Lovely. Lovely. A very good friend of mine read Divorcing Jack, and this was really when it was just published, and uh, I was talking to him and he told me about this fantastic book that he was reading that he absolutely loved. And then over the course of four nights, he was like ringing me to tell me like the next bit. And he said to me, if this is ever made into a film, you must play Lee Cooper, the stripping nonogram. And um, you know, two years later, I heard it was being made and I rang my agent. I said, Divorcing Jack, are they making it? And I said, yes, I've got to play Lee Cooper. I've got to play this dripping nunagrip. Once that's clear, we can wrap it up. Yeah, thanks a lot, Ben. Cheers. OK, Liam? Liam, speak to me. We're still checking, OK? We're still checking. Thank you very much, everybody. That's a wrap. Well done. Thank you very much indeed. Tomorrow night we start with the fall and the dogs and the der chevaux, and then we pick up the end of this with the mini at the end of the second half of the night. Thank you and good night. Well, good morning, rather. You have this little sort of idealistic dream that your whole cast is going to come from Northern Ireland, but the reality of it is you need big names for a film. I mean, originally it was Robert Carlyle was going to be Dan Starkey, and uh, I thought, yeah, sounds pretty good, and then he had to pull out, and it was David Searless, and I thought... <sighs> I was obviously wary about you know, him being English, but when I met him, I just thought straight away, this guy will... I'll do the job. The guy that owns this house says this is a magic city. I think I'll go and get a drink. No, 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 it's a magic city! Don't even think about it. It was very bizarre because the, the film part of Divorcing Jack in the newspaper office where I worked. In fact, David Thewlis was sitting at the desk where I got the phone call from the publisher to tell me they wanted to publish Divorcing Jack. You know, and then you sort of Fast forward four years, and here's a friggin' film crew in making a, you know, three million dollar movie. You see people looking at me whenever they've read the book and wondering how much of me is in there. There's bound to be, you know, it's, it's written in the first person. He's a journalist. Uh, you know, he murders people. I've murdered people. It's one of those things. And action. Are you OK? We start taking the piss, just on. I thought you cracked your head. Do you know what I mean? So it's maybe and a here we are in Botanic Park on our last exterior day which is great news for us because it isn't raining. Uh, it's a nice day. It is freezing cold, though, so poor old Laura Fraser, who in continuity arrives at the party in the next scene wearing next to nothing, now has to do the entire scene dressed in next to nothing on this very cold day. So she's going to be like an icicle by the end of the day. So as soon as Laura saw that we should do another rehearsal, please. My main reservation was whether I could do the accents or not, because I think it's one of the hardest accents in the world, the way you people speak. <laughs> it's, it's very difficult. So I, 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 I hesitated at first about doing it because I didn't want to make a fool of myself by, you know, either patronising the accent or just not being very good at it. Um, but I had a very, very good voice coach and hopefully it's not, <laughs> it's not going to offend too many people. <laughs> Can you teach me how to speak like Ian Paisley? <laughs> it's very easy to do a sort of um, a caricatured idea of what you think an accent's about. And if an actor does that, what tends to happen is that it actually gets in, in his or her way. Why do art students never look out of the window? Yeah. yeah? Window. Pure sound. OK. Yeah. It's my job to make sure that the actors who are in the film who are not actually from Belfast, because it's a Belfast story, all sound as if they actually come from Belfast. He sounds a bit long, a bit shorter. So shall do. This is a very significant scene. It's uh, close to the beginning of the film. And it's the scene in which Starkey picks up Margaret uh, in the park. 
and he has about two minutes flat to do it in. So the scene has been written several times, rewritten and rewritten in order to get that moment right, and we think we've got it now. Why do art students never look out of the window in the morning? So they have something to do in the afternoon. Part of that. Darn Daniel Starkey. Starkey. I've seen your column in the paper. And what do you think? Does it make you laugh? It's better than the other shite. Thanks. Whilst you can try to assess what it's going to be like, you don't actually know how it's going to get hit an audience who've come in out of the cold, uh, sit down, paid their £4.50 and watch it in a cinema. Trying to, trying to assess um, what's going to happen with that is, is very hard indeed. 679, take three. Ow! Oh, shit! Thank you. Thank you. I doctored them for you. It's been eight weeks of fun, but it's been a lot of pressure, you know. It's been a... You know, first movie, the old rookie having to prove his, get his brownie points up. But, uh, you know, I think the, the reaction from everybody's been good. And just fingers crossed we can slap together what, well, obviously edit together precisely everything that everyone's put so much work into. So it's a great feeling, I have to say. It's like actually looking at a, at, a, at a jigsaw puzzle in a box and saying, what do you think of this jigsaw puzzle? And you say, yeah, well, it looks <laughs> quite good. Um, until you actually get to the end of it and make sure that, that you haven't got any bits missing um, and that it's actually quite a nice picture on it. Um, you don't really know. Put this on your wall. Well, here we are in sunny Cannes. Uh, well, it's actually pissing down in the heavens again. This is the uh, second showing of Divorcing Jack. Um, word of mouth, I think, has really built up over the last few days, and there's going to be hundreds of people there tonight. I have my best clothes on, which is like 14 99 out of Duns or, or somewhere like that. And we're going to watch the movie and then just sit back and relax because uh, all the work's done. <laughs> It's October the 2nd, six months on from Cannes, and the uh, film's just opened 128 screens across the nation. This is the scary one, this is Banger, but it's worked. No comment. Hey, how the fuck are you? Your gob's been all over the box. A husband says to me, you should call the fucking pillars, tell him he was in your fucking taxi. Says I, Billy, will you fuck up? Thanks. I have to go back now and make him his fucking dinner. He wouldn't cook you fucking egg. I'll have to stand and cook him fucking crispy pancakes. That's all a fucker need. Well, that's it. Two years out of my life, I suppose. Two years of good fun, madness. Uh, now we can do it all again next year. I'm going to get this job. I've promised to God I've had this job. Je ne regret rien.